Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Barr. I'm the dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. I'm thrilled uh, to be here today for today's policy talk, uh, which is co-sponsored with our Center for Finance, Law, and Policy. Today's event is part of the Ford School's Towsley Foundation Policymaker in Residence Program. Established in 2003, the Towsley Program has enabled us to bring nearly two dozen diverse and high-profile policy professionals here to Michigan to join our faculty for a brief period of time. Our Towsley policymakers and residents teach, they mentor, they collaborate with other faculty, they become part of the life of the school, bringing the real world in all its complexity and its potential right here to the Ford School and the University of Michigan. The Ford School is honored to have our alum, Dudley Benoit, with here, here with us this semester as a 2017 Towsley Foundation policymaker in residence. Dudley graduated in 1995 uh, from the School of Public Policy. He later earned an MBA from Columbia and went on to forge an incredibly successful and high impact career in finance and in community development. Dudley currently serves as the Director of Com Community Development Finance at Santander Bank. He is also the board chair and on the credit oh. committee uh, chair of the New Jersey Community Capital, a CDFI that provides financing and technical assistance to build homes and schools in low-income communities. For the past few weeks, Dudley has been teaching a course centered around lessons from the community development finance field, introducing policy students to finance, real estate development, affordable housing, and related policy issues. Along with his teaching, Dudley organized today's panel of community development experts from across the country to discuss the growing field and what the future holds. I'm going to let uh, Dudley introduce uh, the panel and all the panelists in just a moment. Uh, the topic of today's um, discussion is near and dear to my heart. I've spent uh, most of uh, my time in government and in my research career uh, focused on issues in community development finance. Uh, starting uh, back in the Clinton administration in the mid-1990s, uh, working on what became the Community Development Financial Institutions Fund uh, and the New Markets Tax Credit Program, uh, which unfortunately are uh, today uh, somewhat under attack uh, in the policy space. Uh, let me just say, if you have a question um, for Dudley or for the panelists, we're going to follow our usual procedure here. Uh, please write it on one of the cards passed out at the entrance. Our Ford School team will begin collecting the cards at around 4.40 p.m. Two of Dudley's students, Allison Zimmerman and Gabrielle Horton, will sort through the question cards uh, with Taubman College Professor Mark Norman and read your questions. Uh, if you're watching online, please send your questions via Twitter using the hashtag yeah. policytalks. I've never tried that, but I'm, yeah, I'm told it's fun. <laughs> um, and All with that, um, Dudley, let me uh, turn things over to you. Dean Barr, thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming out. appreciate it. I've um, been looking forward to this discussion for a while. Um, I think everyone's bio is in the program, so I'm not going to – I will introduce everyone, but I won't go through the lengthy um, detail because each of these panelists are pretty accomplished people in their own <coughs> right. I do want to point that Lori Chapman uh, from Enterprise Community Loan Fund was supposed to join us, had a family emergency in the middle of the night and um, sends her regards but could not make it. Um, we miss her, but we will soldier on. Um, so to the, my, the one thing about this panel and the field that I love is uh, we've all in this collectively been in the field for a, a while, and this field is one where people may switch seats, but once they get into it, they typically don't leave. So it allows you to make life um, lasting friendships and partnerships. So um, I, I, I probably impose a little bit on friends to come out here and help me out with this panel. And it's, I'm glad they all accept it. So to my immediate left is Wayne Meyer, um, who is the president and CEO of New Jersey Community Capital, uh, a statewide CFI, but more than statewide. And we'll, those of you in my class tomorrow, he'll come in and talk about the work they're doing across the country in foreclosure prevention. But really a trailblazing institution, and Wayne is a phenomenal leader and inspirer of minds to think about our communities and what needs to be done there. I've had the pleasure of serving on the board of New Jersey Community Capital um, probably going back to 2003, and I just recently, so I should have updated the bio, just recently had to mandatorily rotate off of Wayne's board, but I was board chair for Wayne for the last five years and watched him do amazing things at his organization. Um, to Wayne's left is Lila Wingard, someone who I worked with probably about 
the better part of 15 or 16 years at J.P. Morgan. Um, she just recently retired about a month ago, but she has been in the community development and CRA space, um, although she doesn't look it, for approximately 30 plus years and um, is, has a wealth of knowledge and experience. And she's been a great partner and friend to me as I grew up in the business and as we grew our business and grew how we approached the industry and the field. And she's, as the, her bio states, has just been um, key in developing the field policies, um, really um, just has been enormous help to all of us, not just at our bank, but across the industry and the work that we do. And then lastly, um, on the far left is Roberto Barragan, who I've known the least amount of time, but who I've spent an enormous amount of time with during that time. Um, I think we first met um, five? 2010. 2010, so seven, wow, 2010, when um, J.P. Morgan was working with a lot of CFIs and looking to put equity, grant equity, into emerging CDFIs that were really the way we use on the cuffs, really blowing up and doing more things. And um, Roberto's group was doing trailblazing things in the small business space and we really wanted to support him. And from there, a blooming friendship and a, a great partnership grew. So those are the panelists. So thank you for joining us. And um, in the interest of time, we're gonna jump right in. So first question I have is for you, Roberto. You've worked um, at a, uh, a CDFI that expanded nationally to bring small business lending, which is probably one of the hardest things to do in the community development space on balance sheet, non-government subsidized small business lending across the country. How do you, how were you able to actually make sure you're having the, the community uh, impact all the way on the, on the ground, on the ground versus, you know, there's so many layers to what we do. Um, as a add on, I've been in running uh, nonprofit organizations, some CDFIs for the past 30 years. And the days where you can have a plan, a program, a structure developed, and then go in the community and try to deploy, try to implement um, our days past. Um, unless you understand uh, clearly what the needs are of a community, what you want to do will not match. And there's you know projects and programs and funds all across the country that have been great examples of that failure. The fact is, is that in you know to the extent that you want to get something done, talking to you know to the community becomes number one. And when it's small business, that becomes a little more complicated. Uh, but for small business, it becomes the local chambers of commerce and the local merchant associations first. And I've implemented programs in Los Angeles, Chicago, Las Vegas, New York, Miami, and San Francisco over the past 30 years. And in, in almost every case, my experience has been figure out first what, um, th how they articulate the needs. And again, chambers and merchant associations are a good place to start with in terms of small business and understand what their members are talking about. But because most of what I've done have done is in lending, the next becomes, of course, lenders, banks, credit unions, organizations that are already there trying to lend or trying to deploy capital. And ask them the very simple issue, you know, why do you say no? And in the case, unfortunately, of banks and credit unions, there's more no's than there are yeses to small businesses in particular, entrepreneurs, individuals try, trying to start up a business, everything from a, you know, a, a small convenience store to a, to a bigger uh, manufacturer. You know, you know, what do your denials look like? Why, you know, why are you saying no to them? Even those who are completing complete applications and bringing in business plans and potentially have collateral and maybe okay credit, why are you saying no? What are the issues and challenges in getting capital into this community? Um, and uh, government. You know, yes, you know, a, a government's part of the equation, but, you know, uh, uh, frequently I would, you know, seek input, but not direction, you know, from government. I, I want to hear from elected official. I want to hear from their staff. I want to, you know, talk to the economic development managers in, in, the, in, um, in those communities uh, to understand what was getting done and what wasn't getting done, what needs were being met, what needs weren't being met. What kind of capital was available, be it you know, government dollars, private dollars, foundation dollars, and, and, and frankly understand from them, as, well, all, as all the parties, is to understand you know, uh, what they saw as, you know, not unilaterally and not definitively, but what, they saw, what was their viewpoint and was their opinion in terms of needs being met and not being met. And finally, the, the, um, um, and finally after all of that, it's been, you know, it's been you know, my experience that if you design a program 
based on the needs, based on the challenges, you know, um, uh, that respond to lower credit scores, that respond to lack of equity available, that respond to no collateral. If you program, if you do a program that's designed to that reality, the potential success of the program is that much higher. Because you're, you're not imposing your will, you're not imposing your funder's will on a community. You know, you're saying, you're, you're saying look, at, you know, we're gonna, we, we have this amount of money to, 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 to deploy. You know, from our experience and what we're hearing, we're gonna lose 10% of it. I, you know, I developed a program with Chase that was, it had 20% loss potential. Uh, it was designed that way. It had loan loss reserves, you know, to, to, to meet that. It had, it had uh, criteria designed for it and we implemented and were successful in that deployment because it was designed to meet you know both you know um, um, uh, income wise credit wise you know ethnically demographically to meet that you know that certain reality so that's a quick follow-up are most programs being you know just be perfectly frank are most programs being developed that way no no well you know no um and, and uh, you know usually what happens is that there is some initiative, you know, put together, you know, uh, by you know the SBA, local government, you know, local government, some big city. You know, you know, we're not getting enough capital in there. How do we do it? Uh, most recently, SBA launched, you know, in the prior administration, in late in the prior administration, a program to serve basically African American populations in Baltimore and and Latino African American populations in um, in Los Angeles. And um, they um, uh, talked about, you know, how do we increase procurement, and how do we how do we market a program better, and how do we find capital? You know, it's, it was you know, kind of involved in their own conversation and own kind of just, you know, intellectual conversation that, about what the problems were. And they had no money. <laughs> they had no money. I mean, it was a conversation, a lot of conversation, but no money. I mean, and at the end of the day, you beget capital begets capital. If you're going to have a conversation about a small business loan program, at least you know start with the fact that you know, you know, there's some money available, because if you don't start with that 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 kind of you know you know uh, at, the, at the beginning, the rest is just conversation. Got it. Thank you. So Wayne, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, New Jersey Community Capital is, as we mentioned, a statewide organization, um, but your foreclosure prevention work has taken you to several other states, Florida, North Carolina. I think you're moving into Ohio. Um, so talk about that work, but specifically, how do you um, fit that into the organization's mission? Because that really wasn't initially the organization's mission. You really there to work in the communities of New Jersey. And then how did you get your board comfortable um, with moving outside of your, 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 your natural strategic um, catchment area? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Dudley. First, let me say it's really a privilege to be here today. And part of what I hope is that we can interest and attract more young talent into the field of community development and that's certainly a goal at New Jersey Community Capital and glad to talk to anybody who wants to after this. So, uh, secondly, I need to thank Dudley because he's been a mentor and, a, and a, an amazing leader at New Jersey Community Capital. He's one of those rare guys that if you mention his name around the country, Dudley, you don't even have to say his last name. It's kind of, it's kind of like LeBron. I was going to say Madonna, but you know, I was going to LeBron. But, um, but you know, first of all, let me just start by saying that um, the importance of community development organizations, financial institutions, development corporations, to be able to partner and to be able to collaborate on a meaningful basis. And it's something we have not done well in the sandbox together um, over these years. And, but I see more and more of that type of collaboration going on. I think it's vitally important because in an age where we're working on more complex transactions among different asset classes, you know, education, economic development, housing, and the like, um, that we really need all the best type of talent to figure out how to, how to do that. It's also important if you think about how to allocate capital and how do you absorb capital effectively in some of this work, to be able to do that in partnership, I think, is, is really, really meaningful. And finally, it's around risk, right? As Roberto said, how do you manage risk? So to the extent, let me just start by saying it's really important that we think more and more about how we partner. partner. So New Jersey Community Capital, you know, we do, we're a statewide CDFI. You know, we provide financing and investments to re rebuild low, moderate income communities around housing, around educational facilities, charters and early childcare facilities, around uh, community facilities, 
uh, around economic development type projects and really how do we build safe and vibrant neighborhoods in, in the communities that we work in. Um, but New Jersey is probably, many of you know, has had some real housing issues over these last, since the foreclosure crisis, right? I think we've been number one. You know, we don't like to really lead in this type of stuff, but one or two in foreclosures. Uh, we're number one or two in, in amount of seriously delinquent mortgages. Um, we have a uh, high negative equity in our loans that we've done. And then, and then we have these other indicators, right, that we're the fourth highest cost burden state in the country. So you, it drives us crazy when you think that you have all these houses that are frozen in foreclosure. Um, and, and, and you have people who, are, who, who have dire need of, of quality, affordable housing. So at New Jersey Community Capital, what we tried to do is, okay, well, how can we respond to this effectively, right? So we, we developed a number of programs. We're a lender, right? That's what we do. So we lend to 100 nonprofits in the state of New Jersey to acquire and redevelop housing, to repurpose it, vacant housing, foreclosed housing, as affordable housing opportunities. We started a nonprofit real estate development subsidiary because unfortunately, a lot of the community development groups in New Jersey struggled, right? And, and we've seen that, and a lot of them have been imploded. And that's really an issue for another day, but we gotta figure out a way to rebuild the delivery system around community development in this country. Um, so we developed this really high performing real estate development company, right? That really developed in, in lots and lots of housing in, in, in the state of New Jersey. Um, but then if you think about that, right, we're always are lending to groups that are dealing with vacant housing. Our nonprofit real estate subsidiary is, is developing vacant housing. So we wanted to figure out how do we get ahead of the problem, front of the problem. So we created a program uh, which we call the Restart Mortgage Loan Purchase Program. And the idea was simple. You know, mortgages in this country trade every week, right? All the private institutions, equity funds, hedge funds. We wanted to be able to buy mortgages with the goal of trying to reset them keep families in their home through mortgage modifications. And to be able to then, you know, settle the, the, that, that, the, the blocks in the neighborhoods that, we're, that they're on. And by the way, when a, when, a, when a house is vacant, it was an opportunity for us to redevelop it as affordable housing. So we became one of the first nonprofits to buy mortgages from the Federal Housing Administration in bulk under what they call the Distressed Asset Stabilization Program. And as we were doing that, uh, the state of Florida came to us. They, they, they said to us, um, you know, would you guys think about bringing your program to Florida? And, you know, it's not, you know, nice during the winter, right? Um, <laughs> so we thought, sure, you know. Um, but um, but we had a, it was a really difficult decision for our board, right? Because we're a New Jersey-based organization. That's what, that's what we do. Um, but we thought about it differently in the sense that a, as I went to back before, how do you share best practices, right? How do you collaborate? So, and how does it fit into your mission? Um, so from our vantage point, it was a public policy imperative because there was a lot of talk around housing advocates around the country saying, you know, your FHA, Fannie Mae, Freddie, you're selling our neighborhoods out to the hedge funds, the private equity funds. So, you know, how can you get more of the nonprofits and units and government involved in this? So we ended up partnering with the state of Florida um, in, in doing that. But we divided what we call our North Star guiding principles, right? First was that it was mission and that we were advancing what we thought was a housing policy. Number two, um, we wanted to make sure that we retained a certain degree of operational influence, right? We didn't, because it was reputational risk, we wanted to make sure that we, we were involved in, in doing that. Number three, what Doug we told me all the time, protect the balance sheet, protect the mothership's balance sheet, right? So don't expose the core operations of our business in, 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 in doing that there. And, and last, but it has to be financially sustainable, right? And that's a really important part of the work that we do to around about financially sustainable. So, so, so the outcome was, we, I think, was successful. And, and uh, since then, FHA has made modifications to their distressed asset stabilization program where they now do direct sales to nonprofits and units of government. I like to think it was part of what the work that we did. Uh, Fannie Mae has what they call community impact pools. Uh, we bought 10 of them and we recently partnered with the state of New York and their homes and community renewal, their HFA, to, to partner on buying another 400 mortgages and where they invested money in the fund to do that. 
Uh, and just this last week, you know, uh, Fannie Mae had the first ever community impact pool where it wasn't just targeted to a geography, it was around multiple geographies. And the idea was to be able to bring in nonprofits around the country to help to do that. They were hoping that we would be the lead counterparty on this transaction, which we were, and we ended up winning the bid, which we're really happy about. Um, now, the, the, here's where the housing policy comes in. Because we advocated, housing groups around the country advocated that we should be able to get a second look. If we didn't win this bid, because we're going up against equity funds, hedge funds, that if we don't win the bid, we put in a credible bid, we should have the opportunity to match. And um, we lost by 1%, right? But Fannie Mae had to come back to us and said, uh, if you guys are willing to match this bid, you get it. And we did. So, you know, I think about that, you know, so again, it goes back to it's affecting housing policy. It's bringing and strengthening collaborations. More importantly for us in New Jersey, we're keeping families in our homes who are developing affordable housing. So I, I do want to take a moderator's imperative here to toot Wayne's horn. Um, what, we, what was done with this organization was trailblazing insofar as the only option you had in the past if you were a owner struggling in your mortgage, in, in your mortgage was to basically try to go back and forth with the bank and do a short sale or stop paying and hope they come to you and negotiate and hope to God that something goes your way. Um, so that's not exactly the most efficient way of going about that. But for most people, that was really their only um, hope. And in New Jersey, where I'm from as well, unfortunately, we are a judicial state. So we probably have, we probably lead the country in length of time to get through the actual foreclosure process as well to get you to sheriff sales. Um, in New Jersey, Wayne, the average delinquency was what? People were delinquent like 48? Uh, yeah, about 47 months. So people were delinquent delinquency. four years on a lot of these mortgages before you can get through the whole process. So that's a long time and then you end up creating zombie communities. So um, what they were able to do is basically anathema and part of what Wayne isn't going to talk about is a lot of his nonprofit partners or colleagues were really reluctant to partner with hedge funds because the what Wayne didn't mention on these early funds and to this date, the equity investors mo oftentimes are hedge funds, really the big hedge funds that you hear about all the time. And they were anathema to partner with them because it was against their mission, theoretically, um, which I thought helping the communities were the mission, but that's a whole nother <laughs> conversation. And was able to see and make the board and come to me and have the board see the bigger picture is like we have an opportunity to buy 500 loans at a time here, 300 loans at a time here, own them ourselves, have full control about how they get reset, when they get sold, that's gonna be way more effective to change in communities versus trying to work with, and not, I'm not saying the people that do housing counseling are not doing good work, they are doing God's work, but your ability to affect those communities is a lot better if you own the actual assets and you get to set the, you know, set the strategy versus trying to go back and forth with Chase or Bank of America or the like. So I just want to make sure that that's not lost. Those of you in my class tomorrow will hear more detail about the work that Wayne and NJCC have done. But I think that's the potential on, when you think about policy and impact and impact in communities that these organizations have. So thank you, Wayne. Leela, I want to turn to you. And again, looking at impact, but from the bank side and thinking about um, the way the banks' responses have changed over time. If those of you may not be familiar with the community development field, but it really started um, it, with the Community Reinvestment Act, and I believe sometime in the early 80s, a bank was denied the ability to merge or open a branch, or I can't remember the exact details, because they hadn't followed the regulations of the Community Reinvestment Act. And that kind of sent all the banks scurrying to kind of set up these entities. But it wasn't necessarily a thoughtful or strategic response, it was a defensive response. So Leela, if you could talk a little bit about that history. Sure, thank you, and, and it's a real pleasure being here, being on the campus, and being in this forum to talk about policy issues that affect um, lower income communities um, across the country, and to be on a panel with folks that I've known for a long time who've had a huge impact. Um, and I think, Dudley, you're absolutely right that the CRA was passed in 77. The Humda data first became public a few years afterwards. And community development was really, at that point, reactionary. We were responding to what was expected. 
of banks by the regulatory agencies, responding to the most vocal advocates amongst us who would, who would engage in protests that range from asking the agencies to deny applications for things that the banks want to do to stimulate their, their own institutional growth, or that range from being on the sidewalk outside your building and disrupting your daily business operations. And at that time, in addition to being reactionary, a lot of us in the industry thought of community development more as charity than we did as business. So we were responding to the organizations who said, we need money, we need funding, we need grants to do X. And we were being reactionary. Fast forward to today, we are much more collaborative, we're much more strategic, and much more focused on a double bottom line, if you will. How do we have invest in things that deliver against the community development mission to strengthen communities, but they are also safe, sound, deliver a return for our institutions, and have a strong impact in communities. Housing has long been the focus of the CRA, but over time, it evolved to incorporate small business and economic development and community services. And what we've learned by focusing on the impact of our investments is that if we invest in housing alone, you put people in houses, but you still have to be faced with the possibility that they can't afford to stay in those houses. Jobs are important. Job training is important. Small businesses and economic development is important. Education is important. Having basic services that make for a vibrant community. Grocery stores, for example, there's lots of food deserts across this country because no one has invested in opening stores that sell um, fresh food or an assortment of food in those communities which result in health problems. So there's this whole circle of life that needs to be invested in and maintained over time to create a vibrant community. And so I think what's one of the big things is that over time we've become much more strategic about where we invest, who else is investing in those communities, how can we collaborate not only with each other, but with the community organizations. And as Roberto was saying, um, we not only we can't, as an institution or as an industry, come up with solutions on our own. We have to talk not only to the community organizations, local government, but we have to talk to each other. This is a competitive business for the financial institutions, but it's also a collaborative business. And where some of the deals are so sizable, that we have to work not only with nonprofit partners, but with other industry partners to make the deals um, a reality and to have the impact that will be sustainable within the community. And so I think we've hired more talented personnel. We have hired personnel who are devoted to this field, who don't want to do anything else, who want a job and a career where they can not only do good, but do well. And so we're investing in that as a discipline. We're investing in measuring the outcomes and not just a numbers game, but the real impact on how it's changing the, the trajectory of life for the children growing up in the communities, for the families that reside there and their mobility. And it's, it's, it's very um, analytic to do that and it takes a period of time. Your investments have to be, in some cases, for decades as you start to see, see the change. The other thing I will say as, as a final remark is that, again, we can't do it alone. And nonprofits um, are often trying to accomplish major things without having a real investment in themselves. And so one of the things that's a really important um, element of community development, I think, that we've learned over time that industry has, has um, evolved to in conjunction with, with the nonprofit community, is building the capacity of those organizations that may be doing work that for some reason or another banks can't do or won't do. 
And so how do we build the capacity of those organizations so that they can excel at that work? Thank you, Leela. And I, I, just to piggyback on that, if those of you who are not familiar with the, how the industry started, but the industry started almost as a, for lack of a better term, an arranged marriage. Um, you had banks that had to do this stuff for regulatory reasons. And you largely, on the other side of the um, table, had community organizations that were not in finance by any stretch of imagination, but they were in the business and passionate about improving their communities. And one of the few ways that they can get funding for that, because there weren't a lot of people that were just going to fund community organizing, was through financing loan accounts and tax credit developments and financing affordable housing. And those developer fees and income would then finance the other parts, the mission parts of those organizations. So you started out in a field where you really had bankers and community organizers working together and kind of winging it and trying to figure it out as they went along to where we sit today, where there's a very sophisticated community development finance field. And like I joked in my class, folks said, well, it, it helps a lot of lawyers and accountants send their kids to Harvard and Yale and Michigan. <laughs> um, that wasn't probably what folks thought was gonna happen when the field started, but that's kind of what happens when you, you create a, you know, a multi-billion dollar industry. And that's what the community development finance field is today. And that's kind of why I wanted to have this panel really talk about how do you make sure that these needs are being met at the community level because the numbers can get dizzy if you're thinking about how much we do at banks you know where my bank recently made 11 billion dollar commitment over five years right so how does that actually affect people on the ground it takes a lot of work and effort and there's a lot of things that go into that um, I want to come back to you Roberto um, as you know there's been a lot of talk about um, entrepreneurship small business and you refer to that some as but recently an increased emphasis about you know making sure that we're helping small businesses growing in bloom and in the low to moderate income areas that we all spend a lot of our time working in there's obviously additional barriers and that's making it harder um but you know obviously you talked about getting in there and actually understanding needs but what are some of the other things that you've seen that have worked in these communities well, I, mean, I think um, some of you may be familiar with the pro program from the Small Business Administration called Community Advantage. Community Advantage is an attempt uh, post um, financial crisis to um, give community development financial institutions, which, you know, that's where my experience is, the ability to do an SBA guaranteed loan. And the magic there is, is that many banks use SBA as a product to, to provide additional collateral support to make a small business loan. And banks can do these loans up to $5 million. A number of years ago, the SBA gave CDFIs the ability to do community advantage lending, um, which is, allows us, as a nonprofit organization, to make a loan with a 75 to 85% guarantee from the SBA. The magic behind it is it allows us potentially to increase the size of our credit box, to do a loan to a small business that has cash flow but very little collateral, and at the same time, because again, the magic of the, of, of the full faith and credit of the United States government, be able to sell that guaranteed portion at potentially up to a 10% premium and create another level of income or generate additional income for the nonprofit organization. It's a program that still is in its, it's, in its kind of infancy. Um, they did $100 million last year. That pales in comparison to bank lending in, in that product, but it's a step in the right direction. Micro lending, microfinance, an area you've probably been familiar with, is an area where there's been a lot of, uh, uh, been lots of conversation about its international focus, Mohammed uh, Yunus and the and Grameen Bank, um, and how micro lending has allowed you know very poor households in third world countries to increase how, you know, um, income size. In the United States, it's been something that has had um, um, both tremendous uh, tremendous success and some challenges. Um, more recently, microfinance is seen as some, is seen as something that is no longer relevant, but in fact, it is. It is, continues to be a major way for underserved populations, particularly African American, Latino, small business, or entrepreneurs, to get business started and to move them in the direction of real small business lending. Um, the um, most recently, and um, um, while I'm talking about CRA, Humda and the, and the collection of Humda data allows us to know what a bank is doing in this, uh, underserved communities, particularly in terms of demographics. We, don't, we have not had that similar kind of tool within small business. There is no requirement for a bank to, to identify whether they're, what level of number of applications they're taking for, from minority businesses um, or approving. And that has been prohibited by something called Reg B out of the Federal Reserve. 
Most recently under Dodd-Frank, with the creation of the Consumer Federal Protection Bureau, is a provision that, uh, that's called 1071 that allows for the collection of that kind of demographic data for small businesses um, from banks. It's been, you know, I personally have been involved in that fight for the past 20 years to get that information because as a small business lender, that would change the game. That would basically put uh, uh, banks and all financial institutions under some level of requirement to at least provide data and then be able to respond to, you know, you know in the inadequacies in that data. As you've seen you know, uh, over the past, this past week, CFPB has been in the news quite a bit. Um, there's supposed to be changes there, and I'm praying that doesn't necessarily affect 1071. Lastly, um, one of the things that financial institutions increasingly have be begun to understand, and I, and, 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 and I later spoke to it very, very clearly, in fact, Chase is probably the leading financial institution behind it, is that strategic investments finance by financial institutions at dollar amounts that are significant can create wholesale change in organizations and in communities. The days where you know you have a thousand here and two thousand there and five thousand there to a nonprofit organization doesn't move the needle and hasn't moved the needle for the past forty years of CRA. The fact is is that only the needle, that needle will be moved and has been moved in in, in, in a number of, situ, of, 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 of of situations, including my own with Dudley ten, seven years ago, that allowed an organization that was ten million dollars in size in 2010 to go to 75 million dollars over six years by putting equity and strategic investment into an organization and leverage it and grow it the same, in a similar way as you do with, with a bank. Um, Dudley, could, yeah, could yeah, I just please. chime in here? Another um, thing that um, I would say characterizes, and, I, and Roberto's comments made me think of this, characterizes the evolution of community development is, when I think back over the years, a lot of programs, and lending programs in particular, were started in specialized units within financial institutions, community development groups, because mainstream businesses within the institution didn't think they were viable, were, had no interest in them, they didn't meet the returns. And what we learned by offering these, these programs within a community development group and tweaking them was that we could do a sustainable business and then the program, the lending program, the product, would be mainstream into our traditional business lines where it could be deployed more broadly across geographies, have a much greater impact. So in a way, community development groups provided an opportunity to do some R&D in the community development field and find a way to deliver product, products and programs to underserved communities in a way that was palatable to the broader organization. I think we have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna ask one more question and any of you could jump in. Um, as you guys know, um, many of the leaders in the industry that started, they were either founders or instrumental in the growth of industry or you know, tapping out, retiring, leaving, or for whatever reasons. And we have a great opportunity to refill those seats with the next cadre of leaders. Um, how should the field be doing or focusing and working on increasing diversity in leadership, both at the organization level and the board of directors and the whole kind of the universe of the industry? Uh, that is an amazing question because it's probably the most critical question facing the community development field, uh, at least I know in New Jersey. Um, it's, it's ironic, right after the 60s, we had this whole group of people that created the community development movement, but I don't know, it seemed like there was a, a hiccup in generations or half generations where it didn't seem like many people were attracted to the field. But now we're seeing a turn in New Jersey community capital, one of the major goals we have is how do we attract and retain talent um, in, in, in the field. And I love when I come to my office and I see 10 bicycles, right? We got a lot of young, uh, um, but really amazingly talented people, amazingly talented, incredibly gifted people. So how do you do that, right? Well, first of all, I think it's around the culture you create in your organization, right? Around that and, you know, embrace you know, the great decision-making innovation comes with diversity. I think we have a great diverse board, and I think it starts with that. And then I think one of the things that we have done, we've de developed a fellowship program at New Jersey Community Capital where um, we used to have a housing scholar program in the state, and, you know, um, it, was, it was done away with, like, uh, over the last eight years with the past administration. But we picked it up, and we continue to try to identify diverse, talent into our into our organization 
Um, so uh, and that's one way. And then, it, then it's identifying those emerging leaders and putting them on a, a career path that you know, really maximizes their potential through you know, training programs, management programs, professional development programs. I'm not kidding when I say, I deeply believe it's probably the most critical question facing community development fields. How do you show people that they could make a good living and it's up to us and coming upon us to do that, right? Uh, to be able to, to demonstrate that, but also have a career path that's, that's meaningful. So um, I, I think it's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm an example of someone who's never worked for a bank. I basically started uh, after business school at Berkeley. I basically went right into a executive director of a very small adult education, vocational education nonprofit organization. I got the job because I'd actually been invited to be on the board of directors while I was still in school. I got on the board of directors, and I, first of all, I would encourage you day one. There's no reason to wait to be on a board. There's many nonprofit organizations there that cover the entirety of, of human experience and needs. If you have an opportunity or seek an opportunity, get on the board of directors. It adds to the resume. And the fact is, is that experience on a board, okay? And these organizations are always looking for young, smart people to be on the board. They're looking for them. They want them. You know, because they, want, they, want, you know, because they, they, they need them in order to grow their organization. They need the brain power. And, you know, and, and I'd encourage you to do that. And I ended up, you know, I ended up being the executive director on it because the guy that was in the mix ended up getting fired two days before, and my executive director who was, a pre who was retiring and moving elsewhere had to find somebody quick. He looked around and said to me, hey, you know, I know you came out of business school. Don't you want to make $24,000 a year and work for a nonprofit organization? <laughs> and I was like looking at my, looking at my school loans going, really? Um, but the fact is, is that, um, that over the, I mean, that, that was many years ago. Salary ranges changed, but the fact is that is that particularly in CDFI world, I'll tell you, in CDFI world, we're, we're about numbers. We're doing housing, we're doing small business, we're doing real estate, we're doing commercial development. We can't attract talent unless we have realistic salary levels. And they exist in the CDFI industry. They actually do exist. You know what I mean? So when you hear about, okay, we're here for a nonprofit, oh my God, it's gonna be poverty wages, I can't pay my school loans. The fact is that, that that's, not, that's no longer the reality of the nonprofit field. And there are great opportunities to, you know, that, that extend from being on the board all the way up you know, to working, and more importantly, to leading. Um, so $24,000 was a lot of money back when the bird <laughs> <laughs> So one is, I think it's important in, in opportunities like today that we um, communicate that there are really great opportunities. One of the things that Really interesting, when I look at a number of the organizations, community organizations, the strongest, the viable, um, most impactful organizations, they are led by people with MBAs. They're led by people who have law degrees. They're led by people who just have an interest in strengthening communities, but they have um, fantastic credentials. And there's a passion there. One of the things about the field of community development is there's very low turnover because the work is so rewarding and you can be compensated fairly. I think it's incumbent upon us, including you, who may have an interest in this field though, to be strategic about how we think about it. As, as Roberto said, to, to look for opportunities to get some exposure, to get involved. One of the most um, valuable things we can do is get involved earlier as opposed to later in a variety of organizations and activities so we can gravitate towards and identify those that really strike a chord with us. So you're going to weed some things out and, and similarly the organizations are going to ferret some people out and ferret out the best talent. The communities that are really benefiting the most from community development are very diverse and so having um, diversity of all, all types in the organizations that are helping to solve the problems will help lead to better solutions for the communities and more sustainable. And I think that's something we should you know, think, think about and keep in mind. Thank you. I think we used up our time, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's time to Q&A. Hi, I'm Allie Zimmerman. I'm a dual Master's of Public Policy and MBA student here in my final year. 
And I'm very interested in the work that you do. Um, I came back to school to learn more about the intersection of policy and business and how we can do good and improve social outcomes by working with the private sector um, after uh, several years working in the nonprofit world. Um, our first question today, I'll start with, can you, this is for all of you, can you talk about specific aspects of the proposed tax bill that will impact your organization? Hmm. Um, well, I guess I'll go first on that one. Um, part of my job is to originate low-income housing charge credits um, investments for the bank. For those of you who don't know, the low-income housing charge credit is probably responsible for 95% of the affordable housing that's built in this country every year. Um, as the name denotes, it is a tax credit. Um, so if you take the tax rate from 35% to 20%, you're essentially reducing the value of the credit. What is that, 66%? Don't, John Chamberlain's up there. My math was never good, but whatever. <laughs> um, um, so that's a significant hit. Um, another piece of that was that um, the House version removed private activity bonds. And I can't remember, I, I think it's one of the um, Republicans in Texas really never liked private activity bonds because didn't understand why um, taxpayers had to subsidize all these stadiums and things of that nature, which I tend to agree with, that are being given tax exempt financing. He didn't understand why that, but the part that they don't recognize or ignore it is that about 40% of the, the affordable housing through the LIHTC pro um, program uses private activity bonds. So those are just two examples of how um, they would have a significant um, effect on the um, on the industry. I can't. Re I, I should have printed this out before I came. I meant to, but if the if the house bill went through, I think it would reduce production. I think approximately forty percent. I think the estimates were. I mean, a significant amount of um, uh, effect on the industry. And then another one is I'll stop is the new markets tax credit, which is something Dean Barr worked on when he was in the administration. That is a powerful program that's been responsible for not only producing great projects, and NJCC has gotten several allocations over the years, um, and it would hurt projects, but it also hurts nonprofits, the CDFIs, because those projects are one of the few ways that um, CDFIs and other nonprofits are able to get unrestricted fee income in significant amounts. So it would be like a double whammy. Um, and for everything I'm seeing, and hopefully this will change, it doesn't appear that the new Marcus tax credit will survive either of these bills. Local housing tax credit will survive, but it just will be diminished unless there's some last minute change to what's been proposed. And Dudley, it might go without saying, but the low income housing tax credit, when you talk about that it's the primary source of of equity for affordable housing, that's affordable rental housing. Affordable rental housing, yes. Sir. So that's, that's for folks who aren't going to own their own home, but they're renters, and, and that's really going to hurt. I, I totally agree with Dudley. Uh, also, the historic tax credits are, are another um, program that's in jeopardy on, under the tax bill. Um, but the private activity bonds, at least in New Jersey, with the elimination of tax-exempt private activity bonds would be devastating um, because, you know, uh, that really, in, in essence, eliminates the 4% tax credit for low-income housing um, projects. Um, you know, we hit our volume cap every year, and to eliminate it, I, I just don't even know how much, you know, how, uh, the, the, how much would really diminish our ability to develop affordable housing. The other thing, less so, is, you know, New Jersey is a, is a high tax state, um, and so the elimination of, you know, the state and local tax deduction um, would obviously have an impact. Um, you know, they're going to cap property taxes at $10,000 at least. You know, I guess it's going to go to reconciliation. Um, not so much in the low-income communities, but as we think about fair share housing and trying to bring affordable housing into higher opportunity areas, which is an important discussion as well, um, I, I could see that also having an impact. Yeah, and there's also a cascading effect. I think I can't remember if they cap charitable do donations, but when you're capping charitable donations, capping deductions folks can take, especially in high-cost areas, that's going to inevitably have. Uh, an effect on how much folks are donating to nonprofits and the like. So it kind of all fits together. I would also think that the personal income tax deduction, this, the property taxes, housing taxes would have a huge impact, and not only in high cost states. And 
one of the reasons I'm really concerned about that also is oftentimes people think that the only people who live in um, lower income communities are lower income people. And while it's a slippery slope because then, you know, in some cases when non-low income people are buying in lower income tracts, you're talking about gentrification. But what we want is not to have concentrated poverty. We want to have mixed income communities. And we it's not just the communities that will suffer, but the families. And and so this limitation, which will be permanent in the tax code, would be really concerning to me. Can I can a non panelist add to your list? Sure can. Yeah. So uh, I think the other the other the panelists I think uh, done an exceptional job describing the place based effects, but there are also income effects and health effects in the tax bill that flow through disproportionately to low income communities. So if you look at the uh, elimination of the uh, Obamacare uh, coverage um, that is proposed in the tax legislation, um, the Congressional Budget Office estimates that uh, it would affect about 13 million uh, mostly low and moderate income households. Um, and um, that would be quite significant uh, effects in the community. Similarly, with triggers on uh, Medicare and Medicaid under the sequester, under the trigger provisions, those will have disproportionate effects on low and moderate income communities. All right, the next question. Well, before I begin, just want to introduce myself. My name is Gabrielle Horton. I'm a second year here, uh, second year master's student here at the Ford School of Public Policy. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dudley. I promise that first question was not us trying to cheat on our memo that's due tomorrow. Uh, it's from the audience. Um, but a bit of a follow-up to that question. Um, Wayne mentioned new delivery systems, and Dudley, you also hinted at the complexity of current systems. So if the tax reform does go through, what do these new systems actually look like? So if one of you want to sort of take that, um, that would be great. I think um, on the simplest way, the simplest part of that is on the low income housing tax credit side, it just means more subsidies are going to have to come from um, state and local government. So the, the program is inherently embedded with subsidy, but um, that subsidy gets spread out insofar that the more competition, the more valuable the credit is, the more private equity, private dollars are going to come into. And if you devalue the credit, which would happen under this proposal, that means there's going to be less equity per project. So the government's going to have to do more with do more with the same amount of subsidy dollars. I mean, do less with the same amount of subsidy dollars. So we're going to have to spread those dollars around to fewer projects, which is unfortunate. But it's probably the only way the market will clear. So that's like the most um, the biggest one in my mind that's going to happen. State government's going to have to do fewer projects with their um, in with the subsidies that they have uh, states are going to have to do with less resources and they're in a starved environment as it is and to give you a sense of that and part of its politics but part of it is appropriations um, in 2005 I think we we dedicated in New Jersey 600 million dollars to affordable housing programs some of it came from the federal government um, you know through the home program and, and CDBG and others um, last year, uh, New Jersey dedicated 50 million. And, and, and in the meantime, 37% of our renters uh, are severely housing cost burdening, meaning they spend more than 50% of their income on housing, which is crowds out things like food and health and things of that nature. So what's that trickle down effect to that? Nonprofits have to really rethink the way they do business. They have to become more entrepreneurial. They have to, can't rely on subsidy programs. I mean, we, we need them, don't get me wrong. But they, you know, if we're gonna wait, sit around and wait for a, a program, we're not gonna get much done. So it's gonna really, I think, ha it does have a big impact on, I believe, on our nonprofit community development partners who, who develop a lot of this work. Uh, can you speak about how your institutions uh, specifically are addressing food justice and food access? Um, and maybe, you know, it's on our mind, especially uh, as we're thinking about Puerto Rico and some of the recent disasters. So at, when I was at Chase, we kind of pioneered with, the, with a group called the Reinvestment Fund in Philadelphia, pioneered the first um, 
kind of coined the term food desert. This was 2003, I believe. Um, there was a state senator in, Philly, um, in Pennsylvania that came to the reinvestment fund and said, look, I just got the legislature to pass five, give you $5 million grant so you can start going across the state in places that don't have um, proper fresh food and things like that to uh, build grocery stores. Was, no one ever thought about it. No one ever done it. And I get a call from Jeremy Novak and Don Hickey Brown at the time said, look, we need you to help us put together um, finance. So we took that $5 million and we leveraged that into, uh, I believe, a $35 million fund. I can't remember now. It's too long. But I think that's right. And that's kind of where we started with um, that. So fast forward um, to a few years back, and Michelle, um, First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama, made one of her key initiatives, this whole thing about healthy foods. And a lot of the industry has kind of jumped on that, and they're working on that to the point where we had a big launch event at the White House once. Um, again, at Chase, we helped lead a $100 million fund with uh, the California Endowment and Capital Impact Partners and some others to do fresh food grocery stores across California. Um, the initiative wasn't as successful as we wanted it to be, but it was still a big impact. So, and I think the Treasury, the CDFI fund now gives CDFIs dollars and has a program specifically targeted at fresh food. So you see a lot of CDFIs, banks, and others partnering on that. And now it's become, it went from being a pioneering idea, the reinvestment fund, to being a part of the infrastructure of the CDFI industry. So I think that's what's so great about the work that nonprofits and the CDFIs are doing, alluding to um, what Leela talked about, what happened with the banks internally. A lot of times we would do R&D internally for products that became mainstream products within the bank. Same thing's happening for CDFIs. CDFIs may at some time or another R&D a program that becomes something mainstream across their industry as well. One of the things I, I admired a lot about that program, the, the Fresh Foods Initiative and in responding to food deserts, is um, that it was a permanent solution. It was an investment in communities, in some cases, that hadn't seen a grocery store ever, that only had bodegas or corner stores, or that hadn't had a new retail outlet for food shopping in decades. Um, a lot of times what we have, and it's very important, but it's not a permanent solution, is a response to a specific disaster, which comes in the form of philanthropic dollars and mobilizing volunteers to help. But after the emergency is passed, we don't have a long-term solution to providing food, to providing jobs, to providing a neighborhood economic engine. And so having an initiative like the one that Dudley spoke of is critically important to the long-term viability of communities. And I think um, that's an important piece that I, you know, I didn't even think about because the response to Fresh Foods did that. The stuff that Wayne and his team is working on, similarly, they're trying to develop not just because the work that Wayne's doing actually resulted first out of Superstorm Stan Sandy, um, which was a, a, you know, obviously a big issue on the East Coast. And a lot of folks approached New Jersey Community Capital to do some emergency work about what can you do? And that was kind of, I think, the part of the germ, not completely, but part of the germ of idea for the other issue about, well, let's try to figure out how we purchase things in bulk and have a, a larger effect. So that's a very key part of the work that we're trying to do in this industry. Uh, just, just briefly, the, you know, the food issue, I talked at the beginning about partnerships and collaborations, and we've partnered with the Reinvestment Fund on a number of food shop, you know, supermarkets, food warehouse distribution centers using our new market tax credit. But it is a complicated issue. Um, I live in a low income, moderate, low income community and every morning when I'm going for my coffee, I have kids on my block, you know, buying Doritos and coffee. it's like 6.30. I'm like, guys, you guys got to need to eat that stuff at 6.30. So, you know, I think it's part in the schools as well, you know, and so we, we finance a lot of charter schools and a lot of the charter schools have nutrition programs in, in, in their schools. Um, I think education's a key part of nutrition and health. And, um, you know, we can finance some of the place-based things around that. One of the initiatives that we're, we're beginning to 
work on in Germany it is around, uh, there's a bodega association being formed in Dudley City and Jersey City around how we can, you know, potentially finance, you know, more fresh fruits and vegetables. I didn't realize 100 bodegas in that, in that area. Um, and, and so, you know, so it's, a, it's an evolution. Um, in terms of disaster recovery, uh, when we did our Sandy recovery, FHA did the first ever direct sale where they ended up directly selling to us uh, 517 loans in the most impacted Sandy recovery areas. It was the first time you ever direct sale. They charged us a, a premium, uh, but it was, it, it was not competitive. Because OMB, OMB made them charge Yeah, you. Office Management Budget mm -hmm. made it premium. But we, were, we thought it was important enough to control the asset. So and was, I think another common thing we're talking about here is getting away from products and things and thinking about systems. Because the fresh fruit, what's happened in the evolution of how the industry works in fresh fruits, you're thinking about, okay, you can't just build a grocery store. You have to have distribution centers right. and places that make sense. So in the past, if you told someone community development organization or nonprofit should help fund a distribution center, they're like, well, that's not community development. You know? But yeah, if you're trying to build systems that change people's lives, you have to have these connectors. You have to be able to fund infrastructure as well. Um, some of the folks are doing things. I, thought, I know in Detroit they're doing it, and some of the other living cities, they're doing the um, hydroponic farming systems. They're helping folks use abandoned warehouses to grow lettuce and all those type of things. So I think that's another way the industry has evolved, thinking about th systems versus just thinking about this is housing, this is small business, or whatever. We really, I think, of changing not enough yet, but I think we're getting to a place where we're thinking about the systems that help support communities. All right, this next one is from Twitter, and I love Twitter, so I'm super excited we've got some posts from there. Um, so someone said, passion is great, but how do you evaluate whether local nonprofits truly represent the community? And I'm thinking about this in the context of how we're talking about making sure bodegas, which I also really do love, have access to you know fresh produce, right? How do you know that that community you know, want to keep their bodega, but they also want all these other amenities that obviously lead to better health outcomes as well. And also thinking about sort of you, your organization scaling nationwide, Roberto, how do you identify these local partners when your base, for the most part, has been San Fernando Valley? How do you know that someone in Iowa or Massachusetts is really connected to the communities that they speak about? So if maybe one or two of you all could speak about some of the mechanisms and tools you actually use to evaluate that authenticity. I mean, the... Um when we went into Miami, you know, I spent a number of months um, talking with the SBA, talking with pretty much every nonprofit I could identify that had a handle on small business. Just talk to them all. Just you know, didn't come in with a, didn't come in with a kind of preset notion in mind. Just talk to them, and got a sense of what the challenges were. Who was doing the lending? Who wasn't doing the lending? Understanding that there was a great micro lender in the community, so they didn't need me in there to do micro lending that they basically had other SBA lenders. What they really needed was that fifty dollars to $250,000 loan that a bank couldn't do, and that's what we focused on. You know, when we went to, we were, we, we, were, we were asked by a bank to do a, a, a capital access expo in Las Vegas. Went to Las Vegas, started meeting with all the different nonprofit organizations, and in the middle of one conversation, I had a nonprofit who simply said, look, we're out of money, we're gonna close down. Will you acquire us and, and bring us into your, in, into your organization? And that, that just came out of an organic conversation in terms of what was going on in that community and what, and what is needed. You know, the, the, the thing is, too, is that I, I'm, I always get uh, weird about the word represent. You know, I, never, I, I would never say that I represented the San Fernando Valley, much less the state of California. Well, you know, I consider myself as a technician. My job is to respond to a need. There's a need for capital access. There's a need for small business lending. I can speak to that need. And I can basically help provide products and programs that speak to developing entrepreneurs and growing small businesses in, in communities. And, and so, you know, I was get, you know, that's I think, more the role for nonprofits. I get really scared when you get nonprofit organizations who start talking about, I represent this or I represent that. Because that's not the mission of a nonprofit organization. The mission of a non, you know, most nonprofit is to create change in a certain area of human need. That's our responsibility. That's what we're created. And the fact is, nonprofits, and I go back to what Dudley said, it reminded me over and over again nonprofit is a tax exempt designation. It's not, you know, beyond that, you know, the organization is, cr is created to, cr you know, based on a mission to serve a particular need. And to the extent we can do that and create impact, which increasingly is becoming more and more important and more and more questionable, then we're being effective and then, we, then, we, then, then, then we're really speaking to having accomplished our mission. You should talk about it. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, I was at a meeting with the president of a foundation in New York a while back, and she told me that, you know, that her view was the green development movement was dead and needed to move on. Um, I, I, I obviously totally disagree because I still think local community development corporations work in markets where the private markets don't want to go and government's incapable of going, right? So we work in New Jersey, what we try to do is we take a comprehensive review of how we work in neighborhoods. Uh, we don't do a lot of one-off stuff, right? We work with groups that look to comprehensive, we think about it comprehensive around housing, around education, around food, around economic development. Uh, in order to do that, the groups, and we do have a couple of really good programs in New Jersey, the Neighborhood Revitalization Tax Credit Program, which really forces the nonprofit groups to, when they get resources, to really deep, dig deep around resident engagement. And there's a lot of that type of planning that goes on. And those are the best outcomes in terms of neighborhood revitalization when it comes from the community and the residents. And, and we do have a lot of that in New Jersey. I'm just concerned more that the sector itself is weakening, so they're not going to be able to do as much as they can and are cap should be able to do. And I think a key piece of it is um, very simple listening. Um, the work that Wayne is doing there, and when, he came, when I was still board chair, they would come to me Michigan call or North Carolina call or Florida call and we want to go into that state and my question was always like who are we going to partner with because you know you never want to be parachuting in from another area to do work where other people have been for a long time and I think that's one of the reasons the programs have been so successful because we were coming in to partner with folks who are on the ground had better expertise and being humble about it and understanding look I don't know everything about what's going on here so I need someone that does and has been here that's been engaged that know where the, um, all the pitfall, pitfalls are and know who the good partners are. So it's really having the humility to ask and the ability to listen that I think is really important in, in getting to that place. Did you have no, I would agree in having, having people on the ground in various communities. I've, I had the good fortune of working for an organization that had a presence in two dozen states. And I've never seen a CRA evaluation didn't say that affordable housing was a critical need in that community. But they also go into other needs. And those needs might not be that you, some cities have wonderful education systems and others do not. Some have a thriving small business environment and local economy and others do not. So you really have to, to have people on the ground and have a process and a system in place to get the input, to filter through it, to prioritize, to align it with your institution's business objectives, your strengths, I think, and, and narrow it down. Because we're not, no individual institution is going to be all things to all people or to all communities. So really looking at what are the needs, how do they align with your business objectives, your business capabilities and strengths, and where you can make an impact, and where there's a need where you're not strong, do you have the right relationships and connections to help refer those needs to someone else? And ideally, we can address multiple needs within a community and have an overall impact. Great. Uh, Wayne and Layla, you've both spoken a little bit about recruiting the next uh, class of community developers, and we are a room full of students here. Um, and so it's fitting that one of our questions is, what skills or qualities do you look for in a person that you're recruiting into this field? And what makes them most successful? Um, you know, it's interesting. You know, we have a, a lot of our, our younger generation came from public urban planning or public policy graduate schools. Um, they weren't necessarily trained, say, in lending or in real estate development. Um, but they were obviously committed to economic and social justice issues, which to us is a really important starting point. Um, you know, have an ability to think critically and analytically, we think is really important. Um, we think we can train, right? So it's not a matter, we're not looking for people that necessarily come in with a, a, a credit background or a lending background or a real estate development background. Um, but you know, um, we've been really ex exceptionally fortunate to to really uh, and and again having our fellowship program I think is also has been helpful. Um, 
but you know that's that's really it's it's more around their what their commitment and education and passion is around. We'll we'll, we'll do the training. Yeah, I would agree. I, I've always said that I can teach anyone CRA. Um, I can't teach people if they don't have the desire to be collaborative, to be innovative, to think strategically. Um, sometimes you can help people in that way, but really you have to to have a an interest and a passion. And, and being a CRA manager gives, gives provides a unique insight and an opportunity to collaborate with people, whether they're lenders, whether they're responsible for investment, whether they're they're in the small business space, the housing space. I see, I've have colleagues um, with legal backgrounds, with business backgrounds, with education backgrounds, a wide variety of skills. But what they have is what kind of Wayne indicated is a desire to take their academic skills and put them to use to make a difference in the community. What I looked for um, in my team was people who had a commitment and a desire to balance kind of that double bottom line, the mission and, and, the, um, and the business objectives, and people who look for a way to say yes, as opposed to reasons to say no. So to really look at things, and you're not gonna say yes to everything, but to look at things creatively, not to look at things the way we've always done it, but how can we lead towards change? And, and that requires some flexibility and some willingness to collaborate and to come up with innovative solutions. Three things. Accounting. Get, you know, know how to look at a balance sheet and look at a, at a financial statement. Real basic, not, not in that whole FICO, LICO, you know, um, inventory stuff. Just know how to work your way around a balance sheet and a uh, financial statement. And know, I, didn't, statement. I didn't make him say that because I've been saying that every class. And I would agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, because you, you know, it's some, in some mix, whether it's looking at a, bit, at a development opportunity or looking at a small business opportunity or looking at a program, you know, um, the ability to build a budget is, you th you know, is, is huge. Um, good writing skills, being able to write well, you know, um, key. Uh, whether it's because of proposals, whether it's because of, of, of requests, you know, foundation, government, financial institution, being able to write well. And I spent probably most of my time as a, as a president editing everybody else's work, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but like, you know, and, you know uh, and then lastly, work ethic. Um, Got to have a good work ethic. I mean, I'm not going to tell you that. I mean, nowadays the, 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 the salary levels are much fairer than they ever have been in this field. But the fact is, you know, many times you're going to find yourself doing the work of two people plus. <laughs> you know, these organizations don't have the ability to hire the way, co you know, corporations and universities can. You know, and so, you know, you need be, be a, be a good work ethic and being able to not be afraid to put in those hours and work that, little bit, that, that much harder is always something identified and appreciated by those of us who manage you. All right, we may have time for one more question or is this the final one? Okay, um, so question from an audience member is, some studies show direct cash gifts can create better outcomes than programs or microloans. Do you have thoughts about this? Um, I think the answer to that is yes, that's true, but it's not a political reality in the world we live in. Um, if you look at, that's why I make the joke about all the lawyers and accountants, kids going to Yale and Harvard, because the system we create makes those intermediaries mandatory in, it, in order to get everything done. But um, for reasons that we could all talk about at length, um, we are a nation that don't like to give money directly to poor people. We want them to get a credit, we want them to do this, got to do that. Um, it'd be more efficient, probably less costly if we just cut people checks for so many of these things, but we just, uh, it's anathema to um, the American way. So I'll just be blunt about that. <laughs> um, the city of Newark was last year, I guess, had a Valentine's Day sale. That's right. right? Um, That's a good one. And, um, and so the idea was that they were going to sell a lot of the vacant lots in the city for a dollar, right? Lines out the door, right? people lining up to get the lots. 
Um, so now, fast forward 18 months later, um, not one house has been built. Um, and not only that, now they're burdened with paying taxes they can't afford. Um, and so they're trying to figure out how they can unpack this and maybe put it in the hands of a nonprofit to develop the housing and then um, so, so I, I, you know, y y I, yes, I mean, any sort of donations and is, is incredibly helpful, especially around disaster recovery. Let me put it that way; would be a good example, I think. Um, but I, I do think that, it, it, you know, um, pr promoting economic mobility for families—it's place-making economic mobility. To Dean's, to Dean's point about economic mobility, um, does require, I think assistance in in terms of trying to help people deliver some of those some of those outcomes in my mind in another way of saying it expertise does matter in some in some regards so yeah. great i think this will be our final question uh, lack of financial literacy often leads consumers into unfavorable loans contributing to foreclosures how can we improve financial literacy in this country and in the communities that you work in Wow. Can I be real glib? You know, <laughs> let, me just, let, me, let me guess on a soapbox for a minute. First, the proliferation of online lending, you know, whether it's consumer, whether it's small business, any type of online lending, is way too much money looking basically to, to, to provide capital 24 hours to folks who, um, in the industry, was very unregulated. You know, right now, I think the thing is, is that um, while we do need increased financial literacy and starting at a very young age, i.e., you know, my daughter in middle school, we do need to have that. You know, there also there needs, to be, there needs to be an environment that says that, you know what, you know, we will not allow exploitation of people. That we will, you know, that we, you know you mean, you mean, the amount of regulation that banks face today is huge. The lack of regulation with, with a lot of these funding sources is ridiculous. And so the thing about it is that, you know, I, I get concerned sometimes that we blame the, we blame the person and not the system for not, you know, for, for, for not, you know, uh, to, write, to make that make that possible, and so I think that w one of the things that I've worked with organizations on has been trying to get, you know, uh, online lenders to, to, to just just to, just to tell you what their actual APR is, to tell you what their actual fees are, just to provide the information, because people aren't stupid. If you tell someone it's going to cost them three hundred percent interest rate, they're not going to buy in. If you tell them it's going to be this kind of fee, they will not buy in. So the thing about it is, is that you know, the, 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 just the transparency in, in that product and the transparency around financial literacy, that is a huge part of the issue. I, I also think, and Leela knows this better than most because she dealt with a lot of community groups that um, really came at the, our bank and other banks um, about, um, so when Bank One and Chase merged, merged, Bank One I think had a huge, a big business with pawn shops and check cashers and all this stuff and a lot of the community groups basically were really adamant about that we had to get out of that business. And I think eventually the bank got completely out of the business. But the unintended consequence of that is that when you have regulated institutions competing with these non-regulated institutions as competition, drives down pricing, may make it a little bit fairer. Now you get every regulated institution out of the business. It's, only the, it's the wild, wild west. So they kind of won the battle but lost the war, the community groups. They got all the banks to stop doing this stuff. but they. They have no lever against Chico's cash check cash, right? Chico doesn't care. Protest him all he wants. He actually is. Chico's not even there. Chico's probably in Boca Raton playing golf. You know, so <laughs> that's some of the things folks aren't strategic in thinking about when they, um, sometimes when we get out the pitchforks and the placards and things like that, they're not thinking about systems all the time. Um, but the thing, and this is one of my pet peeves when these type of questions come up, because there's a couple things I like to say. Like, Low-income people aren't dumb. They're just poor. They make extremely rational decisions based on their life. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of nonprofits and CFIs are always trying to compete. Oh, the, the rates, like Roberto said, so the rates on check cashing are uh, this is terrible. Why do these people do this? Because it makes sense for their lives. It doesn't necessarily make sense for your life with the savings account, college degree, but for what they do, it makes perfect sense. You're there. You're competing on price. They're competing. They're worried about convenience. You know, so a lot of times it's, we have a paternalistic way of looking at these problems. And the last thing I'll say is, the best way to know how to manage money is to actually have money. <laughs> we somehow expect poor people to have all this experience and this financial literacy about what the best way to save. If you don't have money, saving is more esoteric. And I don't, I'm not trying to be facetious. You still need to save and things of that nature. But 
you won't know how to do a, a trust for your children unless you had to be in a position to do a trust for your children. It's just never going to be anything you're going to do if you don't have excess money to do that type of things. You're not going to know how to do um, all the fancy things that folks that have money to leave behind do unless that's something you actually do. So it's kind of, I always find it odd when we talk about financial literacy, just like we talk about education, that's, these are poverty issues. But we don't want to talk about poverty, so we talk about sometimes things that are ancillary to them. So it's just like, think, oh, though, Dudley, yeah. if I could, and, and I'll try not to get on my soapbox, because <laughs> when Dudley and I start going back on soapboxes, it never ends. <laughs> but, um, but we have a lot of fun. Um, financial literacy was one element, but there were a lot of causes to the foreclosure crisis. And, and my soapbox is, we, again, can't blame it on one factor or one group of people. And one of the things that we should also keep in mind is what happened with unemployment. And who unemployment hit first, and who it stuck around with for the longest amount of time. So folks who were already living like on the edge, making their mortgage payments, but they didn't have six months, 12 months saved up, and they lost their job, and it took them a long time to recover, were very vulnerable in that time period. And so again, one of, you know, Someone I know says the best community development program is a well-paying job. Mm -hmm. If you don't have transferable skills, if you don't have the ability to recover from or sustain an, a temporary interruption in employment or a downsizing that means that you take a less well-paying job, it's very hard to... Um, maintain your mortgage and your housing payment. So there's a lot of connectivity to broader economic variables that are occurring, which makes the opening question we started with about what's gonna, what's gonna be the impact of the tax proposals on community development and on families, a really interesting question, because when you start to think about some of the downstream impacts of what this will result in, if all of these corporate savings aren't reinvested in better paying jobs, I think we're going to see many more unintended consequences than are being discussed today. I would just add, I can't, not much more I can add to that other than if you really look at the data from the foreclosure crisis, um, that well-counseled home buyers were a a slight default rate as opposed to people who were not counseled, and that's absolutely a fact. I mean, is this myth that CRA caused the, 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 the foreclosure crisis couldn't be further from the truth? And, um, you know, even in our mortgage program, we've modified now 600 mortgages for families, $60 million in principal reduction. Um, all of them are counseled. We've had three redefaults where, where the redefault rate on mortgages are usually like 20, 30 percent. We've had less than one percent. And, and, I, and I attribute that to the great work our counselors do. And it, there's counseling and there's counseling, right? The ones that are like three-hour counseling programs or you see that all the time, that's not counseling. It has to be really an in-depth commitment around financial counseling to make it work. And I think the data absolutely bears that out. So um, let me just say uh, what a great and interesting conversation. Please join me um, in thanking our entire panel. Um, we uh, add two other things to thanks. One is uh, Ray Waters uh, is here in the audience I didn't see before. Um, uh, Ray is, uh, runs the Detroit Development Fund, which is a wonderful CDFI in the city of Detroit. So those of you who are trying to combine your interest in the community development and finance with making a difference in the city of Detroit, come bother Ray at the reception for, <laughs> for a job. Um, and uh, the, the last thing is, uh, please join us in the, uh, in the Great Hall for a reception for, um, uh, in honor of this panel, and uh, thank you once again. <laughs>